It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10. Our top story. A Conservative MP says he'll step down before the next election. After an investigation into whether he used political donations to cover medical expenses and pay off so-called bad people. The probe into Mark Menzies finds a pattern of behaviour below the standards expected by MPs, but no misuse of funds. Also tonight... You're telling me that I cannot walk to the other place. I'm telling you that I have to be escorted I will help by, you by you by escorting you over there. New details of an exchange between the police and a campaigner who was called openly Jewish. Tonight, he accepts an apology from the Met after a meeting in London. I accepted the apology from Assistant Commissioner Matt Twist for his absolutely outrageous statement Friday, which basically blamed me for being anywhere near the marches. A baby delivered by C-section, her mother killed in an airstrike after southern Gaza is hit by warplanes for 48 hours and Israel promises to increase military pressure. We have a report from Rafa. A family pleads with people to get children vaccinated against measles after their five-month-old baby girl is admitted to hospital. Records broken at the London Marathon in the elite women's race and more than 50,000 join the run. Plus in the sport, Manchester United are into the FA Cup final after beating Coventry on penalties in one of the greatest semi-finals in cup history. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. A Tory MP facing allegations of misusing campaign funds has quit the Conservative Party and says he won't stand at the next general election. Mark Menzies made the announcement after claims earlier this week that he used political donations to cover medical expenses and pay off what were called bad people, who'd reportedly locked him in a flat and demanded thousands of pounds for his release. The backbench MP for Fylde in Lancashire disputed the allegations but was suspended from the Conservative Parliamentary Party while an investigation took place. Sky's political correspondent Nick Martin reports. The project will disrupt wildlife, agricultural land and our communities. Mark Menzies is at the centre of some serious allegations and that's that he misused party funds. But the claims are bizarre, that last December he made a phone call at three in the morning to his campaign manager, allegedly saying he was being detained at a property by bad people and needed £5,000. It's claimed local campaign funds were eventually used to pay the money. With the police looking into this claim and the Conservative Party also investigating, Mr Menzies issued this statement. It has been an enormous privilege representing the people of Fylde since 2010, but due to the pressures on myself and my elderly mother, I have decided to resign from the Conservative Party and will not stand at the forthcoming general election. This has been a very difficult week for me and I request that my family's privacy is respected. Voters in Mr Menzies' constituency have filed a safe Tory seat, gave their reaction to the news. I was quite shocked. I don't really know what's gone on. Um, but I do think he's a really nice chap and he's been, you know, he's been a marvellous MP. I think he's it's, due. It's, it's, it should step down, yes. Because uh, if it was a Labour person that had done that, he'd been asked to step down immediately. The money was apparently paid out of a local campaign fund not connected to the Conservative Party. The party's now concluded that their own funds were not misused, adding, however, we do believe that there's been a pattern of behaviour that falls below the standards expected of MPs and individuals looking after donations to local campaign funds which lie outside the direct jurisdiction of the Conservative Party. I have to say that statement released today seems to be an attempt to wash the hands of the Conservative Party from this particular issue. There wasn't an attempt, for example, to contact the whistleblowers in this case, and yet these problems have been known about since January. It's really important that political parties take these issues seriously because, frankly, the damage for politics isn't just for the Conservative Party. Mr Menzies is the latest in a long line of MPs to leave the Conservative Party of late. In fact, a total of 12 Tory MPs have been suspended from the party since Rishi Sunak took office. Ultimately, this could all prove quite damaging for the Conservatives. 
at a time when they want to focus on key election issues, not party controversies. And Nick joins us live now. Nick, the Conservatives have lost another MP before the next election. How damaging is this for them now? Well, I think uh, what these suspensions, one after the other, serve to do over time is erode reputation. And this is at a time where politicians want us all to believe that they are the gold standard of everything that's right and proper in society. But what it also does, I think, is give the opposition, Labour and whoever else for that matter, a huge amount of ammunition in which to take pot shots at the Conservative Party, the government and more specifically Rishi Sunak. And remember, this is a time where he is desperate to try to win over voters to say that he is the party for the next government, trying to take credit for things like driving down inflation and easing the cost of living crisis. None of this helps that cause, especially at a time when Rishi Sunak has to decide, he has to strategize when is the best time to take the nation to the polls. These kind of controversies ruin that plan completely and it could put the Conservatives in real jeopardy. Thank you. And for more on this, you can scan the QR code on your screen right now. You can listen to the latest episode of our Politics at Jack and Sam's podcast. This week, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, and Politico's UK editor, Jack Blanchard, discuss the PM's trip to Poland with defence high on the agenda. And could the Rwanda bill finally become law? The anti-Semitism campaigner at the centre of the row with police has told Sky News he's had a constructive meeting with the Met tonight. The Metropolitan Police has apologised again for an exchange between an officer and Gideon Falter at a pro-Palestinian march in London, in which he was referred to as openly Jewish. The Prime Minister is said to be appalled by the comments. Sky's Paul Kelso reports. When Gideon Falter tried to cross the path of a pro-Palestinian march, he forced the Metropolitan Police to make a public order decision they've come to regret. Sky News footage reveals in full for the first time an exchange that lasted 15 minutes, in which officers are clear very early that the Jewish campaigner's race is a factor. Yeah, I'm sure there are an awful lot of people of all sorts of faiths and creeds who want to go around. When he persists, the officer tells him he is being provocative. After refusing a police escort on an alternative route, he challenges officers to arrest him. I want to walk that thing, that's what I'm going to do. Sir, so, you have to arrest me. I'd rather not do that. Then do it. I'd rather not. I want to get out of here. I want to go across there. I'd rather not, sir. When the exchange catches the attention of some marchers, Gideon Falter is subject to abuse. Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! This and worse is the sort of abuse Jewish Londoners say has gone unpoliced and unprosecuted, making them unsafe in their own city. The Met's assistant commissioner, Matt Twist, has now written to Gideon Falter to offer a private meeting to apologise, and Jewish community groups will be invited to an operational planning exercise to offer reassurance. We remain focused on doing everything possible to ensure Jewish Londoners feel safe in this city, the Met said in a statement. We know recent events and some of our recent actions have contributed to concerns felt by many. It's crucial we listen to those feeling unsafe to go about their daily lives and take immediate action to address their concerns. Their experiences must continue to shape our plans. I accepted the apology from Assistant Commissioner Matt Twist for his absolutely outrageous statement of Friday which basically blamed me for being anywhere near the marches and said that being near marches was provocative and that also by publicising what had happened, um, I had put a dent, quote, in the confidence of many Jewish Londoners. Met Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley will meet the policing minister this week as well as Jewish community leaders, but thus far is resisting calls for his resignation.
I think what happened was completely wrong. It's not right that one group of people in society should be told that they can't go around their daily lives uh, because it might be a provocation to someone else. That's not how equality works in this country. One, two, three, four. The policing of pro-Palestinian marches has left some British Jews feeling isolated. Regaining their confidence will be a weekly challenge for the Met. Paul Kelso, Sky News. Benjamin Netanyahu has in vowed to increase political and military pressure on Hamas in the coming days after a number of airstrikes hit Rafa in the south of the country, which is now home to more than 1.3 million people displaced by the war. It's the first time we've heard from the Israeli Prime Minister since the retaliation on Iran on Friday. Israel has continued its focus on Gaza with further airstrikes overnight. 22 people, including 18 children, were killed in the later strikes on the southern city of Rafa, close to the border with Egypt, where more than a million people sought refuge from fighting in the north. Sky News teams on the Strip have filmed some of the destruction over the last few days. A warning, this report by our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, has images of people killed in the attacks. In an incubator in a Gaza hospital, a baby girl less than a day old. She was born an orphan, delivered by surgeons as her mother lay dying. We had to do an emergency caesarean to save the baby. Thanks to God, we managed to save the baby. The mother was in a very critical condition. Her brain was exposed, so we saved one of the two. She has no name yet. On the tape, the writing says, the baby of the martyr Sabrina al sakani Her mother, Sabrina, her father, Shukri, and her three-year-old sister, Malak, all died in the Israeli airstrike. Her uncle showed our team their pictures. He says he'll care for her now. I will embrace her and look after her. I hope I'll be up to it. God willing, I will look after her and take care of her. I will be her guardian after her father died. Allah It has been a horrific 48 hours, even by Gaza's standards. 17 children and two women, all from the same extended family, died when another Israeli airstrike flattened this building, say Palestinians. Our team was shown pictures of some of them. At the hospital, relatives mourned the children, killed, they say, as they slept in their beds. These children were sleeping. What did they do? What was their fault? Pregnant women, sleeping children, the husband's aunt is 80 years old. What did this woman do? Did she fire missiles? We complain about our concerns to God. The strikes all in Rafa have provoked unusually sharp criticism of Israel by the UK government. Foreign Minister for the Middle East, Lord Ahmad, tweeting he was appalled by the Israeli strike on a residential apartment in the densely populated Rafa in Gaza, which resulted in more children being killed. We must stop this fighting immediately, he said, and bring an end to this conflict. But this is likely just the beginning of a new chapter in the Gaza war. In an address to the nation ahead of Passover, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu used language from the Bible to justify what is coming in Rafa. As a result of this, it has only hardened its conditions for the release of our hostages. It is hardening its heart and refusing to let our people go. Therefore, we will strike it with additional painful blows and this will happen soon. Israelis say they must take the fights to Hamas in Rafah to bring back their hostages and destroy the enemy. But far more civilians are being killed than Hamas fighters in this war. Rafah is the most densely populated area of Gaza. And when the offensive begins here, many more will die. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Jerusalem. The UN Special Envoy for Lebanon has warned the danger has not gone away in the region. In an interview with Sky News, she's appealed for calm, wisdom and de-escalation. On the Lebanese border with Israel, the Hezbollah militant group and the IDF regularly exchange rocket and drone attacks and they appear to be growing in intensity and scale. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, reports from the South Lebanon border area. There's a trail of devastation on the Lebanon-Israeli border. And a dangerous job for the UN monitors here has just got a whole lot more risky. 
Swathes of villages and towns have emptied as people have fled the bombing with tens of thousands on both sides of the border now without homes. There's a lot of direct hits on houses here. Absolutely demolished. Nothing much left of them, actually. Almost every patrol, the soldiers find new damage and fresh destruction. For sure, it's quite daily. You know, every day? Uh, yes, every day we can count something different kind of activity and in different uh, um, uh, numbers. The UN peacekeepers, helped right by now, the Lebanese army, are very much caught in the crossfire. They're trying to hold the blue line, an unofficial divide separating the disputed territory claimed by both Hezbollah and the Israelis. But it's those living in these areas who are most suffering. You can say it's dangerous to stay here, uh, but we can. We, we have to stay here actually to survive, to keep our to keep our uh, home safe, and uh, uh, we have to stay here to keep Alma safe actually. There's so much crossfire on what's meant to be a demilitarized zone that the UN troops have found they need to shelter in bunkers, sometimes multiple times a day and night. You're, you're called peacekeepers and there's no peace. Yes. You're not keeping any peace. No, but peacekeeper it means also what we are doing is uh, make our part to create the condition for a better solution. And the situation is continuing to cause alarm, with dire warnings to all involved from the most senior UN diplomat in Lebanon. One mistake, uh, one miscalculation uh, can make uh, a difference and put this region in a completely uh, new situation. And Lebanon taking into account the uh, geostrategic position is uh, in a very sensitive place. The situation is horribly familiar to many, like Abu Jamal, who still has the key to his home in Palestine that his family were pushed out of in 1948. My dad told me only one or two months and we'll go back. And we've been here in Lebanon for 76 years now. At the Palestinian activist hub where we meet, there are symbols everywhere reflecting what he and others cling to. We'll never forget Palestine and our land. This is our map. We don't forget. Even if it goes on for a hundred or a thousand years, we won't forget. The dangers on the southern border are now so high, many of those pushed out of their homes here fear they too may end up never returning. Alex Crawford, Sky News in South Lebanon. Parents are being urged to vaccinate their children against measles as rates of the infection continue to rise. There have been more than double the number of cases so far this year, more than in all of 2023. It's left babies and other vulnerable groups at risk of the disease, which can be deadly. Sky Shaman Freeman Powell has been speaking to one family whose baby is too young to be vaccinated but was admitted to hospital with measles. Five-month-old Margot is usually a happy and bouncy baby. But a few weeks after a hospital visit, her parents noticed a significant change. And a letter would later confirm that their daughter had been exposed to a highly contagious disease. But immediately I knew she's got measles. I mean, her skin was completely covered in a rash at this point from kind of her knees up to her head, um, really red and blotchy, and she was so unhappy. She was so unwell, she ended up in hospital as eating and breathing became difficult. And, and it's really scary because I'm holding my little baby and she's struggling to breathe and she looks god awful. Margot is not yet one, so unable to be vaccinated against the infection, which left her unprotected in the midst of a measles emergency. In the last week, 86 cases of measles have been confirmed in England. There have been almost 900 cases of measles already this year, a sharp increase from 368 cases in all of 2023. About two-thirds of those affected are under the age of 10. At one point, jabs for measles had all but eradicated the spread. But vaccine hesitancy is thought to be driving the rise. And an initial outbreak in the West Midlands has now spread to every region.
we've had poor uptake over about the last 10 years and it's been going down a little bit each year which means that we've accumulated a big group of people who are susceptible to measles. And that doesn't just mean children, that also means young adults as well. Margot will be fine and has gained immunity after fighting the disease. But her parents aren't complacent, determined to get her jabbed as soon as she's old enough to protect her and other children from mumps and rubella too. Shaman Freeman-Powell, Sky News. Liz Truss was Prime Minister for less than two months, resigning after a disastrous budget that spooked global markets. She blames institutions like the Bank of England and the Office for Budget Responsibility and told our economics editor, Ed Conway, she didn't even speak to the bank governor, Andrew Bailey, during the crisis. You, you had all these problems with the Bank of England governor and you talk about it you know, in depth in, in, in your book. He's, in, in a sense, if there's any kind of villain in it, that's, that's the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey. Um, Simple question. There you are in office. He's causing all this trouble for you. What did you do about it? Did you, did you call him up and say, this, this is problematic? Did you call him in and say, listen, we need to change this? It was a difficult situation because the Bank of England governor deals with the Chancellor of the Exchequer rather than a Prime Minister. Yes, but you are the Prime what Minister. I didn't, and what often I the Prime didn't Minister want does to meet do, the Bank of England governor. What I didn't want to do was undermine the Chancellor. Okay. in him trying to sort out the situation. So, so did you meet Andrew Bailey? No, I didn't. You didn't? And you I, didn't... I wanted... I, I actually had a meeting set up and I wanted to meet him, but I was okay. advised that would be a bad idea. A vigil has been held to remember the victims of last weekend's stabbing attack in Sydney. Six people were killed when a man went on a rampage at a busy shopping centre before he was shot dead by a police officer. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has said that the $60 billion aid package to his country, voted through by the US House of Representatives yesterday, would send the Kremlin a powerful signal. The bill will now go to the Senate and is expected to pass on Tuesday, with the weapons expected to be delivered as soon as next week. And they can't come soon enough for Ukraine, which has been losing ground to Russian forces in recent months. Here's our US correspondent, Martha Kellner. Look at the destruction of the Ukrainian city of Chernihiv. Look as its people cower from the silence. <laughs> and understand the relief here that reinforcements are on the way. Air defences officials say could have thwarted this Russian attack, which killed scores last week. Now the US is providing the means to get them. Its president is grateful for the cash injection from Washington, but not fawning. The Americans are not funding the war in Ukraine. They first and foremost protect freedom and democracy all over Europe. And Ukraine is fighting, and Ukraine is sending its best sons and daughters to the front line, and it reduces the price for all Europe, for all NATO. This nation's very existence, the fate of these soldiers, was hinging on a vote 5,000 miles away. A fact not lost on its people. The boys need help because they have nothing to protect us. They need weapons, they need gear, they need it. We always need help because without help, our enemy can advance further and can be in the centre of our city. I heard our president say we could lose the war without this help. Thanks very much. It was a great event. It's mid- and long-range missiles like these which Ukraine has asked the US for. The decision by the US to approve the $60 billion of aid will be very welcomed by President Zelensky. The challenge is how quickly can these weapons actually get into the hands of the warfighter. We understand some of the weapons have already been forward deployed to Poland and therefore it could be a matter of weeks before they're at the front line. After six months of waiting for assistance from America, a delay which has cost lives and time, they're even desperate for ammunition. It is no silver bullet. But here, they hope it will hold the Russian advance at bay. Martha Kellner, Sky News. 
It was a record-breaking turnout at the London Marathon today, with more than 50,000 people taking part in the 26-mile run. And a new world record was set in the elite women's race by Olympic champion Perez Jepchuchir. Our correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury, was in the crowd. <laughs> Officially the most popular marathon in the world. 578,000 people applied for the ballot, so reaching the starting line itself is quite an achievement. As they lined up, a tribute of applause for last year's winner. 24-year-old Kelvin Kiptum, who tragically died in a car accident in February. He'd set a new London marathon record of two hours, one minute and 25 seconds. <laughs> This year's winner came just short of that. Alexander Munial broke clear of his rival with three miles to go and came home in two hours and four minutes, giving the men's title once again to Kenya. History was made on the streets of London with reigning Olympic champion Perez Chipchirche taking about a minute off the record set here in 2017. And for the first time this year, wheelchair winners Marcel Hogan and Catherine de Brunner get the same prize money as non-disabled runners. But the biggest money goes to charity. The London Marathon is the world's largest one-day annual fundraising event. Last year, it raised £63 million. My name is Paul Donnelly. It's my 10th marathon. Running in memory of my dad for the RNLI in lifeboats. Hi, my name's Anna. This is my first marathon. And I was doing it to try and finish and to raise some money for Samaritans in mind. My name is uh, Miguel. This is my fourth marathon and I'm t uh, running for uh, Salvation Army. Uh, my name is Victor Garrick. Uh, this is my second road marathon. Uh, I'm running for Black Trail uh, Runners. Among today's record-breaking 54,000 plus participants. And we're off. The race has started. Yeah. The Chancellor. Thanks for your brilliant support, everyone. He joined 20 MPs taking part in today's race. Another new high number at this year's record-breaking event. Excellent. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News, at the London Marathon. Time now to get all the very latest sports news with Leah. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. This is a glimpse into the future of AFC Bournemouth, a multi-million pound training ground that is getting closer to transforming the club completely. Owner and American businessman Bill Foley was visiting from his home in Las Vegas, an opportunity to see his vision becoming reality. It looks spectacular. It looks spectacular, but maybe... That's the, that's the difference you've got. Could we have saved a few million pounds? <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, it certainly looks incredible, that's for it's, sure. It's, uh, I mean, Women's academy, first team, um, unbelievable facilities are, are going to be here. It's, uh, this will be one of the best training, training facilities in the league. When it's finished, it's going to be unbelievable. Despite being Bournemouth's owner for less than 18 months, he's been bullish with his predictions about survival and made huge strides off the pitch in an industry that promises fans so much but fails to deliver. So how has he kept his word? Transparency, be honest. I'll always tell the truth and always be and really always be honest and uh, I had I have big ambitions for this team and I know we can do it because I've, I've done it I've done it with the with the Golden Knights our, our hockey club so you've translated what you did in Vegas to Bournemouth with the same model the same infrastructure the same plans same same plan same program it's expensive you've got to put a lot of money behind your um, to keep your word you've got to put a lot of money behind it but the goal is now that we're, we've moved up the table a bit, which I was confident we would do this year, I believe we'll start attracting more talent, better talent. They'll want to stay in Bournemouth. They won't want to move on. Uh, so that's our job, and a place like this, this, this indoor pitch that we built. It's fantastic. Was that always your plan to put things in place that enabled the club to grow organically, but challenge those teams eventually at the top of the table? Absolutely. You know, we want to play in Europe. Do we get to... The top four, top five, complicated, difficult for Bournemouth. Uh, but with a new stadium and these facilities, we can keep on doing better every year, just improve a bit, improve a bit. We have a really good team, and it's, the team is motivated in becoming a team as opposed to a group of individuals. If we can keep on doing that as we 
move on through this season and next season, the season after, we'll be successful. If someone had said to you all the things that you'd achieve and, and so on when you invested in Bournemouth, when you bought this great football club, would you, have, would you have believed that you'd made so much progress in such a short space of time? Well, I'm running out of time. So I have to make sure I do things quickly and efficiently. <laughs> I had complete confidence in what we could do. Once I met, uh, once I met our management team and, and some of the football staff, I, I knew what we could do. And I knew if, with the right resources behind it and the right attitude, a winning attitude, and a never give up attitude, I knew we'd be okay. I was very confident. Wow. It's gigantic, isn't it? You're one of a, a number of Americans that have invested in the Premier League. Is there, is there a reason why you think that there are more American businessmen that are looking at English football as a vehicle to get into the sports industry, to potentially make money, to be a part of something that's a global product? Is there, is there a reason why you think that's the case? Yeah, well, I mean, football is the greatest sport in the world. And the Premier League is the greatest league in the world. And so if you're going to invest in a, in a league or a team, why not invest in the best? Even if it's not the, the biggest team in the biggest town and so on. And so for us, uh, we're not a sovereign wealth fund. We're not financial sponsors. We have, we have limited resources. But so we had to go with a little smaller club and then try and improve it and make it better and better. We came to the UK and came to Bournemouth to, to listen and to be part of the community and not be the arrogant American that comes in and wants to change everything. So I believe you see, Mark, that we, we've been very consistent in the way we've approached our business philosophy. Uh, and uh, we will continue to be consistent. We'll make mistakes. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. I uh, just want to bring you some breaking news now from the Reuters news agency, and that is at least uh, five rockets have been launched from Iraq's town of uh, Zuma towards a U.S. military base. That's in northeastern Syria. Um, uh, and that's according to Iraqi security sources uh, speaking to Reuters. And the attack against uh, U.S. forces is the first since early February when Iranian-backed groups in Iraq stopped their attacks against U.S. troops. And this attack comes on the same day that the Iraqi prime minister uh, returned from a visit to the United States and met with uh, President Joe Biden at the White House. Two security sources and a senior army officer told Reuters that a, a rocket launcher fixed on the back of a small truck had been parked in Zuma border town with Syria. Uh, and the attacks came uh, one day after a huge blast at a, a military base in Iraq. That was early on Saturday. So just to uh, reiterate that uh, breaking news, according to Reuters, at least five rockets were launched from Iraq's uh, town of Zuma towards a US military base in northeastern Syria. And of course, keep you uh, updated on that story should more information come into us. But uh, in the meantime, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by John Stevens, political editor at The Daily Mirror, and Camilla Turner, political editor at The Sunday Telegraph. Amongst the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of the mail, their headline, Jewish leaders call on Met Chief to quit. We'll be back with that story and others. Do stay with us. I think some of the articles are a little bit misleading. So let's remember what vegan food is, first of all. It's food that's free from meat, dairy, eggs and fish. And a message for all vegans and the entire nation is that what we need to be focusing on is fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains. Those are the foods that are going to help prevent disease, feed your good gut bacteria. Our good gut bacteria eat fibre, help us maintain a healthy weight really, really easily without dieting. Those are the foods we really, really need to be focusing on. But sometimes when people hear the word vegan food, they think all of the processed foods, and they can play a part. This is all vegan food in front of you, isn't this, it? This is all vegan food, absolutely. Would you eat it? I eat mostly whole foods, mostly plant-based whole foods, and that's what maintains my health, my gut, great energy, um, and hopefully is going to 
help prevent disease in my later life. Processed red meat and red meat are classified as type 1 and type 2 carcinogens, so we do need to worry about things like potential disease later in life. There's many other ways of making this sort of food. You can make it with other... Sub they're called substitutes, but really they're just foods in themselves, like tofu and tempeh, which are made from soybeans. You can make your curries without any of this sort of stuff, for example, using chickpeas instead of chicken. That would be the absolute healthier way of doing things. Um, there's a huge, huge range when it comes to plant-based meats. There are some that are made with less ingredients than others. There are some that are cheaper than others. There are some that taste really fantastic. There are some that are just very much soya-based, for example, or and a lot healthier. So it really, really depends. But personally, for me, there's other ones other than these that I might eat. But people love these. And like I said, they're great for transition. They're great for the environment, much better than meat. And we still know that these foods don't have the cholesterol in that meat have or the trans fat. They often have less saturated fat. And we know that red meat, even two portions a week, can increase our risk of type 2 diabetes. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with John Stevens, political editor of the Daily Mirror, and Camilla Turner, political editor at the Sunday Telegraph. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Starting with the front of the mail, Jewish leaders call on the Met chief, Sir Mark Rowley, to quit. The Times says voters are losing faith in the police to maintain law and order. The FT quotes the president of Ukraine, saying that his country has tough weeks ahead as it waits for the aid approved by the United States to arrive to bolster the fight against Russian invaders. The Sun has this exclusive, saying that British holiday flights are being jammed by Russia. The PM faces calls to put Afghan concessions in the Rwanda bill. That's according to The Guardian. The Eye reports the Tories face a new pay clash with public sector workers before the next election. The Mirror has this exclusive as Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer joins Doreen Lawrence with a pledge to support the next generation in memory of her son, Stephen. The Metro reports that one school head in London is planning to bring in a 12-hour day for pupils as part of his efforts to tackle their addiction to mobile phones. And the Star tells us there's an April miracle on the way. It's about to stop raining. We'll believe that when we see it. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by John Stevens, political editor of The Daily Mirror, and Camilla Turner, political editor at The Sunday Telegraph. Welcome to you both. Let's start with the front page of The Daily Mail. The headline there, Jewish leaders call on Met chief to quit. Uh, this is following uh, that altercation with the anti-Semitism campaigner at the Palestinian 
march that uh, we've been covering and has been uh, covered by very many other people. Your thoughts, John? Yeah, well, clearly the Met Police made a mistake in this case. It's clearly very difficult if you're a police officer in duty when they've got one of these big protests happening in the middle of London. They're clearly very loud. There's clearly a lot of pressure on officers. But the officers involved in this case clearly did make a mistake. They were saying to this anti-Semitism campaigner that um, he was being provocative by being openly Jewish there. And they were suggesting at one point in the video, it was on Sky News earlier today, um, the guy was basically saying to the police officers, would it be OK for me to cross the road if I took off my skull cap, which is obviously... Uh, quite a worrying state of affairs. But the questions are now here for Met Police Commissioner Mark Rowley. It sounds like he's going to meet Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, tomorrow and then be meeting with the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, later this week. I mean, the suggestion here, I think it's from Gideon Full to the man involved. He's saying that he thinks that Mark Rowley should step down. I think that clearly what Mark Rowley needs to do to be able to cling on to his job is to explain to both Sadiq Khan and James Cleverly, how he intends to make sure that Jewish people feel safe in London. Mm. Um, Camilla, in their uh, apology that the Met have uh, promised to meet with um, leaders in the Jewish community and also to run um, mock protest events and so they can get their advice on how they can deal with it um, in a better manner, do you, do you think that they've done enough by way of that apology and they're, they're agreeing to look further into how they police these events? Well, I think for these Jewish leaders that are currently so frustrated by the state of affairs, they're actually calling on the head of the of the Met to quit. I think for, for them, probably what they'd want to see is a different method of policing in these large-scale protests. They would argue that it's been going on for six months. Um, you've got a situation where Jewish people don't feel safe in central London because there are these large protests and this incident with Gideon Falter, I suppose, was a particularly egregious one that has just really shone a light on this whole issue. A lot of the anger is being put on Sir Mark Rowley. He is at the top of the mat rather than the individual rank and file police officers who are just in a very difficult situation trying to manage with crowd control. Um, I think the fact that Sir Mark Rowley is being hauled in for a meeting with James Cleverley, with the police minister, with Sadiq Khan, just shows how seriously this incident is being taken. And I think what would allay the fears of the Jewish community is really, I suppose, a change in the way they, they, their policies are and, and the way they police these events um, so that Jewish people are, are made to feel safe. OK, let's move on to The Guardian, John, uh, their front page story regarding the Rwanda bill. Um, the suggestion is that the Prime Minister is being urged to include an exemption for Afghans. Yeah, so this is um, the Rwanda bill that we seem to be talking about, goodness knows how long. And it sounds like tomorrow night it will they'll just keep sitting all night until it finally passes. So it will go in between the House of Commons and the House of Lords until they finally get an agreement on it. And I felt that over the last few months, the government have almost quite enjoyed rows over the Rwanda bill. I think they think it's quite good for them politically. But this is a row that is rather uncomfortable for them. It's talking about uh, people who helped with British military in Afghanistan, people who worked as interpreters, and whether they should be exempted from the Rwanda bill. So if any of those arrive in the UK, that you would say that those will not be sent to Rwanda. And the government has been refusing to put this exemption in there. And it talks about in the story in The Guardian how this is privately making a lot of Tory MPs uncomfortable. But it's got a quote there from a government source saying that nobody's in the mood for concessions on Afghan veterans. And it sounds like the government's not going to give in on this. Mm. But what are your thoughts, Camilla? Well, I think from the government's point of view, they just don't want to give a single inch when it comes to concessions on this bill. Their view is, you know, we start making concessions. Where does it end? We just want to get this bill passed. But I do think this, um, th th this argument about giving Afghans who have served alongside British troops risk their lives um, for the sake of the UK and have then found their way to this country. Um, this idea to make them exempt for being sent to Rwanda, it's initially um, an amendment tabled by a Labour peer, but it has got quite a bit of support, and particularly within the armed forces community, there are really kind of top brass military figures backing this um, amendment. So 
if there is one, for them to, to, to grant a concession. And I think it would be this, but the government are really trying to hold firm, hold the line, and just say, no if, no buts. We want to get this passed without changing anything at all. Mm. We read that uh, Rishi Sunak is considering whether to hold a, a news conference tomorrow to urge peers not to frustrate the legislation further. Let's move on to um, Ukraine, in front of the Financial Times. Um, we know that they've had that... Uh, promise of weapons from the United States much longed for. Um, will it be enough in time is the question. Well, Zelensky's been out this morning or the, earlier today he was on American TV and he was saying that this might mean that they have a chance of winning the war. And as you say, they have been desperately waiting for these weapons. The US have been talking about this aid package for six months. And it says in that headline there on the front page of the, MT, of the FT, Kiev has no time to lose. And I guess the question is now, how quickly can they get these weapons to the front line? I think there's talk in some of the papers about how some of the uh, ammunition's been kept in warehouses in Poland. So some of it could get there rather quickly. But Russia has clearly been making a lot of progress on the battlefield in the last few months while Ukraine has been waiting for these weapons to get there. Uh, Camilla, we've only got a, a few uh, seconds, but just a military analyst commenting here that uh, Russia will still have an artillery advantage. It just won't be as great. Yes, absolutely. I think this article um, also puts across some of the arguments just to counter some of that positivity. Here we've got um, a Ukrainian official saying at best this will slow but not stop the Russian advance. An analyst saying this will buy the Ukrainians a year perhaps. Ultimately, the Ukrainians are still completely up against it with the Russians and whilst this aid package will really help them, it may not be a total game changer in this war. Mm. But we read that weapons could uh, arrive as uh, soon as the, the, this week, in fact. So, um, yes, speedily acted upon. Thank you both for the moment, John and Camilla. We're going to take a break. Coming up, bad news for some school children addicted to their mobile phones. Your headmaster might bring in a 12-hour day. Stay with us for more on that. and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent.
Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, John Stevens and Camilla Turner. We're going to have a look at um, the Sun in this section. An exclusive they're, they're claiming, and the story about uh, Russians hacking um, holiday flights. British holiday flights are being deliberately jammed by Russia. Thousands of flights targeted. John. Yeah, I mean, this is quite worrying for anyone planning a holiday in um, Eastern Europe anytime soon. It's flights flying to places like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and thousands of Ryanair flights, I think just over a thousand Wizz Air flights in the Baltic region in the last eight months have been impacted by this. Some of the times it's they're not able to access their GPS as normal. But some of it sounds so worrying. They're talking about in this Sun story, they're claiming that some flights seem to have bogus data in their um, GPS systems, which means that planes suddenly have to dive to avoid phantom objects that aren't really there in the sky. You just think anyone on one of those planes, is suddenly you have to kind of dive to avoid them, it um, would be quite worrying. It talks in the piece about how it's extremely dangerous, and I think that is probably uh, right, that it is clearly quite worrying this is happening to domestic aircraft, that it's not just military planes that it's affecting. Yeah, extremely worrying, Camilla, isn't it? Yes, that's right. So these are electronic attacks, um, supposedly by Russia, where they must be able to hack into the plane systems and cause them to take a flight path they wouldn't ordinarily do. If you were a passenger on one of those planes, that must be absolutely... Um, kind of exasperating, you're sitting on a plane and suddenly you're swerving and then unbeknownst to you that's actually a hack by Russia potentially. Um, I think this is a very worrying development and really um, seems to be a step up of, of you know, kind of Russian interference mm. um, in civilians' lives, not just military. These are people going on a holiday not expecting to be any kind of target whatsoever and yet and another thing I think is that the aviation industry and planes, normally it's seen as incredibly safe. There's very few accidents um, and it's something that you can be quite certain that you get on a flight and usually things go very smoothly. So the fact that this is now becoming a target is extremely worrying. Yes, it is indeed. When we haven't got any detail as to how it's, it's being combated, um, that I suppose will come in time. The Metro, uh, this story, very interesting story. I'd be interested to see the, the take of parents as opposed to the take of, of uh, pupils. But uh, there's a head, I think he's in, um, in London, in West London, introducing, I think if the article is correct and, and we believe what we read, a 12-hour school day all to stop uh, children's pupils' addictions to mobile phones. Yeah, this is a head teacher. He's in Notting Hill. And this is an optional thing. It's not compulsory because obviously 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. school day sounds like a lot of time at school. He's doing this. He says that um, if you get kids in school and you take their phones away from them and you get them to other activities, it means that they're not doom scrolling on their phone. They're picking on things like art, dodgeball, basketball, cookery classes after school and you get a hot dinner. I mean, it sounds like a good idea and um, it is clearly quite worrying about the amount of time kids spend yeah. on their... It's worrying about the amount of time I spend on my phone yes. and the adults spend. But yeah, particularly about school children who aren't doing all nice creative things, they're spending time with technology. Camilla, do you think it's a good idea? Um, I think it's a very interesting idea. I don't think <laughs> children would um, agree. Um, but this head teacher is saying um, he's dealing with a situation where you have children 100% addicted to their mobile phones and to social media. So, yes, it seems like a very drastic solution to keep children in day for 12 hours. Um, but he's advocating this because he thinks something drastic needs to be done um, to change the way that children are interacting with their peers, um, that the whole way they socialise, he says, is, is changing you're getting a kind of awkward generation of um, youngsters who don't know how to forge proper friendships in real life because they spend all their time staying up at night on their mobile phones and that's not a healthy way for, for children to, to live their lives or to interact with their friends. Mm, the thing is that most schools take the phones um, away from them during the, the school day. So, I mean, this very much would, as you say, have to be on a, a voluntary basis after school with the, with the clubs. Um, and I'm not sure many of them would want to hand in their phones. So let's see what the take-up rate is of this particular scheme. John and Camilla, thank you very much for the moment. Let's take a look at the weather for you now. Well, we're in a fairly settled spell, but cloud and a little patchy rain are spreading from the north.
There'll be a mostly cloudy start tomorrow with drizzly outbreaks over central parts, but the south of Ireland and southeast of England look dry and sunny. Expect a light frost in parts of the southeast. It'll stay mostly cloudy through the morning with outbreaks of generally light rain or drizzle spreading to many parts. But southeast England and the south of Ireland look like staying dry and bright. The far north will brighten later on. Scotland and Northern Ireland will see sunny spells spreading from the north during the afternoon, while the southeast of Ireland will cloud over. There'll be a little change elsewhere. Cloud and patchy rain over Britain will clear across the southeast on Tuesday. Most places will then be fine. Coming up next on Sky News at 11, MP Mark Menzies decides to resign from the Conservative Party following allegations he misused campaign funds.